And now, please welcome Dr. Uh, Mary Haley to the podium. Dr. Haley is a research fellow in the history of art and visual culture at the Center of, of Gender and Women's Studies, Trinity College Dublin, the University of Dublin, Ireland. She is an Irish Research Council RD and a Fulbright Scholar. She will present us a paper with the title uh, M Madame Lucas Rubiquet's Artistic Portrayal of Late 19th Century Algeria. Thanks, Dr. Haley. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. So before I uh, begin my paper, I would like to extend my sincere congratulations and my thanks to the Orientalist Museum for organizing this fascinating conference. I'm delighted to be here, so thank you. Only one female artist, Henrietta Brown, 1829 to 1901, has been recognized within the canon of French Orientalist art history. My overarching body of work attempts to rethink the French Orientalist canon by compiling primary source information about women artists who practiced in France and in the Maghreb region of North Africa between 1860 and 1962. Through archival research, I've examined 86 largely ignored French female artists whose works show influence of Orientalist subject matter, many of whom were hugely successful artists in their day, yet today we know little to nothing of their artistic contributions to Orientalism. So in my paper today, I will discuss just one painting by one French woman Orientalist, and that is a, a, a complaint with the Kadai, painted in Algeria, uh, circa 1896, and it's painted by the French woman orientalist Marie Luca Rubiquet, and we can see Luca Rubiquet on the left there. So, in my reading of this painting, I adopt an approach used by Linda Need in her article entitled The History in Pictures, uh, which incidentally was published in Cultural and Social History in 2010. Need considers the recent intellectual trend in the discipline of social and cultural history where scholars are engaging more critically with the pictorial and visual materials, questioning how does one see art as an historical document, one which is deeply embedded in particular cultural values and conditions of existence. So thinking about Luca Rubiquet's painting as an historical document, in this paper, well, I will attempt to answer three questions that speak to the, to the painting's relationship with socio and cultural history. Now, question one is what was Marie Luca Rubiquet's style of Orientalist painting? And this section, it also includes a discussion of the painting's uh, pictorial qualities. Uh, question two, why did the artist choose this specific subject matter, one which is rare to the field of Orientalism? And three, in what way does this painting represent a historic locus uh, between East and West? However, before I address these questions, I want to briefly set the painting into its historical and what I would claim is its very problematic theoretical context. French Orientalism in art of the long 19th century, it was driven by a series of historical, colonial, and political events. Mm -hmm. Of particular influence to French Orientalism was the conquest of Algiers by the French in 1830, which marked the beginning of the long 132-year period of French colonialism in Algeria. Today, on interpreting uh, Orientalism via global dialogues, there is a tendency to oscillate between the many complicated, and diametrically opposed opinions which somewhat unsystematically construct the Orientalist discourse. For example, post-colonial and humanist rejection of colonial conquests collide with artistic appreciation for unique art object production and instances of cross-cultural learning. To discuss further, Brana Kabani claims that many Orientalist paintings, and I quote, portray the Oriental male as villainous, creating a distinction between the barbarity of the Eastern male and the civilized behavior of the rest Western male, close quote. Likewise, Meleka Lula claims, and I quote again, Orientalism portrays Algerian peoples via vulgarities and stereotypes to a point of caricature, close quote. 
Now, very conversely to these opinions, considering Orientalism from a very different position, John Mackenzie states, and I quote again, it, Ill, it will not do to pick and mix artists from different points of the 19th century and portray them as being locked into a set of racial and imperialist assumptions. Although critics of Orientalism have professed themselves as seeing messages of languor and laziness in the imminent images of scribes penning letters and boys studying the Quranic schools, such paintings can equally be read as showing respect for learning and literacy suffused by religious belief." Close quote. Acknowledging such varied clashing opinions about Orientalism, it will be evident in my readings uh, of a complaint with a Kadai that I myself stand torn between high regard for art making as a mode of cross-cultural learning and consciousness of an image which was produced during a violent period of colonialism. It is not my contention to claim that this painting is an accurate depiction of specific late 19th century Algerian people, or that it and the artist are void of any political or colonial constructs. In fact, these enabled Luca Rubiquet to paint in Algeria. Rather, I contend that even through periods of colonial devastation, moments or methods of communication across cultural learning can still occur. And in this specific case between a French woman artist and the Algerian cultural attribute that she depicted. So just a little bit of information about Marie Luca Rubiquet. Um, she was born in Normandy uh, in France in 1858. In uh, circa 1875, she studied fine art in Paris under the French Orientalist artist uh, Félix Joseph Barrier, who also practiced in Orientalism. During her 54-year artistic career, which spanned between 1880 and 1934, Luca Rubiquet exhibited her works widely. She received numerous prestigious awards for her art, and subsequently in 1922, she received uh, the esteemed title of Knight of the Legion of Honor from the French government in recognition of her artistic successes. From 1891 to 1905, the artist lived in North Africa, all the while sending her paintings back to France for exhibition and sale at the Salons of Paris. Luca Rubiquet uh, exhibited a complaint with a Kadai at the official Salon of Paris and the Orientalist Salon of 1896. Now, based on documentation, the painting uh, was most probably painted in Trogort, which is in uh, an oasis region of Algeria and the north, uh, northeastern area of Algeria. The painting portrays what we can assume uh, was a complainant making his case to the local Kadai. Now, the Kadai is on the left, compa the complainant is on the right. A Kadai was an appointed Muslim judge who ruled in accordance with Islamic law. Although understandings vary from country to country, knowledge of the judicial practice of Qadis can be traced back to the seventh century to the beginning of Islam via Adab al Qadai texts which define the etiquette and rules for Muslim judgeship. In pre-French colonial Algeria, Qadis adjudicated over all disputes and legal matters in, according, uh, in accordance with the teachings of the Quran. Under French colonial rule, the role of the Kadai was altered dramatically and placed under and in accordance uh, with French law. From 1888 to Algerian independence in 1962, the authority of the Kadis was limited to matters of Muslim succession, marriage and paternity. This limited authority of Kadis was in place when Luca Rubiquet uh, painted the work in question. Uh, therefore, we can only surmise that the uh, complaint portrayed in the, the painting is related to one of the aforementioned legal matters. So as detailed in Adab al Kadai texts, the model Kadai should distance himself from the influences of politics and power. It was mandatory that Qadis meet exacting professional and legal standards, and, Mus and the Muslims who occupied these positions were to comply with procedural and behavioral guidelines. Now, examining the pictorial elements of a complaint with a Qadai, it is evident that Luca Rubiquet has portrayed the Qadai working in accordance with these stipulated Islamic rules. 
that is, although the cation complainant are seated in very close physical proximity, the artist has painted them in such a way that there is an expressive visual division between them. The Kadai's attention is not on the overt hand gesture and somewhat intense or irritated disposition of the complainant, but rather the judge's focus is entirely on the legal ledger he writes in. The Kadai's averted gaze, his composed facial expression and body language tell the viewer that in accordance with the stipulated rules of Adab al Qadai texts, he has detached himself from the potential influence of the complainant's fixed gaze and stern body language. On painting her sitters in this way, Luca Rubike has visually articulated her knowledge about the role of Qadis and their legal and ethical obligations. So answering question one, of my paper, that is, what was Marie Luca Rubique's style of Orientalist painting? Well, the artist's skill as a naturalist painter is evident in the work, not only in, her, uh, in the presentation of her subject matter, but also in her application of paint. Now, Emil Zola defined the naturalist as one who depicted his or her subject matter through the method of scientific analysis and as a result represented his or her sitters interconnecting with their environment. So traits of Luca Rubique's naturalist brushwork are distinctive as strokes move from the detailed to impasto. For example, she has painted the complainant in the style of conservative realism, the detail of his skin, hands, facial features, and clothing, all, uh, as well as the prominent color tone of his body. In contrast, while she has painted the Kadai's skin, facial features and hands with the same realist precision, she altered her painting technique and executed the Kadai's clothing in Impressionist style. The softer Impressionist brushstrokes in the judge's garments give the illusion that he is dissolving into the similar style Impressionist background. So clearly the artist executed her sitters with deliberate contrast in painting styles and tones. These pictorial qualities suggest yet another historic disconnection between the two men, perhaps legal, emotional, or one which might be racially driven. Luca Rubique's meticulous attention to naturalist detail is evidenced by the placement of the shoes on the mat, suggesting the respectful observance of custom, or the Kadai's scholastic books and papers which are scattered in the foreground. Furthermore, the beautifully executed intense light and shadows rendered within this interior permit the viewer to comprehend the heat of the exterior Algerian sun while the Kadai and complainant conduct business in the cool temperature of a shaded room. The problematic diffusion of light, and that is the whitening effects of sun on land, was considered to be a foremost struggle of the Orientalist painter. So using astute naturalist techniques, Luca Rubique clearly triumphed uh, over this problem. For example, her strong, uh, the use of strong beams of light which flow from the painting's background to foreground give the viewer the sense that just, uh, that just outside the portrayed room, beyond the picture frame, awaits the intensity of the exterior Algerian sun. Luca Rubique used light and shade to invoke the viewer's senses. This naturalist artistic ability personifies the words of the art critic René Moreau when in 1897 he stated, and I quote, Luca Rubique's visual poetry belongs to an artist of the highest order, close quote. So considering uh, our observations thus far, and that is Luca Rubique's informed description of Islamic judicial practices, her acknowledgement of simple cultural characteristics and her portrayal of atmospheric elements and her interconnection or incorporation of exterior environment in an interior space. Together they demonstrate that a complaint with the Kadai interacts with the viewer's senses by means of Zola's naturalist description. It can be claimed that Luca Rubique attempted to describe to the French salon viewer her understanding of this very unique Muslim practice uh, in Algeria, circa 1896. And this painting is, for the most part, far detached from Alula's claims of, and I quote, Orientalist painted vulgarities which caricaturize our Algerian peoples to a point of obscurity, close quote. So moving now to question two of this paper. 
And that is, why did Luca Rubiquet choose to paint this specific subject matter, which again is rare to the field of Orientalism? In order to answer this question, I first turn to art critics' responses to Luca Rubiquet's Orientalist scene. In 1896, art critic and editor of the Gazette des Beaux-Arts, Louis Gans, stated, and I quote, it seems that after Eugene Fontmartin and Gustave Guillaumet, there was nothing more to say about Algeria. However, French painters in Algeria have become real explorers. Luca Rubiquet shows herself naturally more feminine and more delicate in her touch, but no less just or confident in her achievements. A complaint with a cadai is, in my opinion, one of the best and one of the most charming pictures of the 1896 Salon. From this review, it's clear that Gans held the artist's work in very high regard. Likewise, in 1895, a noted art critic, Olivier Merson, referred to Luca Rubiquet as, and I quote, an artist who stands out amongst France's best modern oriental painters, an artist with masterly and virile-like talent, close quote. What is evident here is that even though both Merson and Gans applauded Luca Rubiquet's masterly artistic talent, both critics still drew her back into the socially preordained marginality of the woman artist. That is, Merson referred to Luca Rubiquet's artistic talent as virile, uh, therefore suggesting that a woman artist had to have male characteristics in order to be masterly. Likewise, Gon stated that Luca Rubiquet showed herself naturally more feminine and more delicate in her touch. Now, I would claim that Luca Rubiquet has provided us with a demonstration of painting which is in no way delicate or gentle. Rather, it is artistically strong and confident in its execution. So clearly, in their late 19th century context, art critics struggle to rationalize Luca Rubiquet's artistic confidence and her place as a professional painter in France. Their true admiration for uh, her Orientalist technique was infiltrated by false assumptions about the positions of women, men, sex, and gender in the 19th century art world. And this is no surprise, considering that Gans and Merson lived in a society where gender assumptions were indoctrinated via 18th century texts, such as Rousseau's writings and the Napoleonic Code of 1804, in which ideas of bold or strong individual brilliance were deemed inherent inherently masculine attributes. So this interesting use of words in art critical writings about Luca Rubiquet's Orientalism leads to a contemplation uh, of the relationship between gender and forms of art production during this period. Of course, women were not permitted entry into the École de Beaux-Arts until 1897. Thus, Luca Rubiquet is mentioned, was trained through private tuition in uh, circa 1875. Denying women artists entry into the most prestigious artistic institutions attempted to place limitations on their access to life drawing classes. This then placed supposed limitations on their artistic growth, which in reality resulted uh, in fewer commissions, which inevitably led to many women artists' elimination from the canon of art history. Now, maybe somewhat ironically, I would claim that this historical marginality of women artists in France was a major influential factor in the development of Luca Rubiquet's Orientalist approach, particularly her very unique choice of North African subject matter. Now, this is predominantly the case when considering that, for the most part, uh, the artist's wider Orientalist oeuvre uh, portrays North African women in interior spaces. Now, obviously, I don't deal with this topic here, uh, but it is the uh, core subject of my forthcoming monograph. However, a complaint with the Kadai focuses on Islamic judicial practices in Algeria, an all-male profession and subject matter, which was also very accessible to French male artists. Therefore, it is open to question whether or not the artist's gender was an influential factor in her choosing this particular subject matter. The judicial or legal system in France, a strictly male profession throughout the long 19th century, was depicted by artists such as uh, René de Mure, Paul Cézanne, and uh, Jean-Louis Forin. Women artists had limited access to this subject matter in France. Therefore, scenes of French judiciary practices in their paintings have yet to come to the surface. Interestingly, 
As a woman artist in Algeria, the Orient, and I'm using the Orient in its 19th century context, acted as a space of enablement for Luca Rubiquet, where she was presented with access to a judicial subject matter. As previously established, the Islamic judicial system of the Qadis had far less authority in colonial Algeria than the French legal system. Thus, this lower position of the Islamic Qadai in French colonial Algeria opened the subject, to, uh, op opened the subject matter to Luca Rubiquet's female artistic gaze and allowed her to paint it. This discourse brings to the fore the complexities of the crossing view of the French female other with the Algerian cultural other, a complicated and divided historical meeting space where an otherwise marginalized French woman artist could find a form of artistic liberation at the expense of Algerian self-sovereignty. Subsequently, it is here in Luca Rubiquet's historic position of female artistic li uh, liberation that we might find just one motivation for her choice of subject matter in a complaint with a Kadai, and that is the artist may have chosen to paint judicial practices in Algeria because as a woman artist located in France, she could not. So transitioning now to the third question in this paper, and that is in what additional ways does this painting represent a locus uh, between East and West? By the 19th century, as part of the French civilizing mission, French modernization, reform and construction had taken hold of urban cities and towns in Algeria. By 1896, a French city had virtually replaced the traditional Berber, Turkish and Arabic Algier. Rejecting French colonial modernizations in the cities, artists searched for the natural cultural uh, Algerian cultures in rural desert areas of the country. And this fashionable orientalist pursuit of ethnographic cultural location can be attributed to Luca Rubiquet's complaint with the Kadai. Yes, the painting is more gentle in its disposition than, for example, an erotic harem scene. However, it can be claimed that this work is still subject to reading through Roland Barthes' reality effect, which discusses naturalism, naturalism as a form of full authentication of myth. <coughs> Yet even in light of this awareness of the flaws of naturalism, what makes me probe further into Luca Rubiquet's representation of the Kadai is the painting's inscription, which you can see on the left upper side of the canvas. So written on the background wall above the Kadai are the Takbir and a paraphrase of an Islamic Hadith. Line one of this Arabic script, the Takbir, is a common expression of faith used by Muslim peoples and it reads, and I quote, praise be to Allah, the highest or greatest, close quote. Line two of the script, the paraphrase Hadith, is an expression used in Islamic schools of Judah Prince and it reads, and I quote, O oh Allah, make me more knowledgeable, close quote. An engraved copy of a complaint with a Kadai appeared in Le Monde Modern in 1896. The Arabic script in question is also visible in the engraving, thus this evidence shows that the script has been an original part of the painting since its execution uh, in circa 1896. That is, the text was written either by Luca Rubiquet or under her instruction and not added to the painting at a later date. The artist's inclusion of this script suggests that her artistic style was partially influenced by Islamic art. Although Islamic art encompasses very different media, differs greatly in time and between nations and regions, it has certain unifying characteristics, calligraphy being one of its most basic components. Calligraphy or script and it was and still is used in Islamic art as a means of artistic expression and decoration as well as a written communication. When observed in the context of Luca Rubiquet's painting, the, the close juxtaposition of the Kadai to this meaningful religious script suggests an expression of the Kadai's legal and religious duties, which are fulfilled by the knowing of Islamic religious law and knowledge of impartial events or facts as reported by the complainant. However, what is most interesting about the inclusion of this Arabic script in the painting is Luca Rubiquet's acknowledgement of Arabic languages, a concept which essentially was diametrically opposed to the principles of the French civilizing mission in Algeria. That is, at the core of French colonial activities in Algeria was a complex and overwhelming history of Algerian change, resistance, and location of cultural identity. 
language was a deep-rooted part of the French mission. Therefore, the Frenchification of Algeria included the assimilation of the French language into the country. Now, according to uh, Mohamed Ben Rabah, uh, and I'm quoting, the ideology of language superiority was so powerful th that the French never doubted the domination of the French language in Algeria. From the early to the final years of French occupation, colonists never questioned the legitimacy of their linguistic hegemony. French supremacy and linguistic imperialism were embedded in their colonial vision, close quote. Now, of course, Luca Rubiquet's rationale for including Arabic script in a complaint with the Kadai can be interpreted in many ways. Similar to Said's and Mackenzie's diametrically opposed opinions concerning Orientalism, diverse interpretations about the script and painting can also run up against and potentially deconstruct one another. One interpretation is that the artist was, in part, submitting to a popular fashion in French Orientalism of the time, the search of, for native characteristics amongst French, French modernization. In addition, providing a very different interpretation, it can also be claimed that this woman artist confronted cult, uh, French cultural hegemony in Algeria by learning about and acknowledging Arabic language and Islamic religious law practices. When shown at the Salons of Paris, a complaint with a Kadai would have visually communicated information to the cultural outsider about Muslim social life in French colonial Algeria, circa 1896. So to conclude, this paper engaged critically with the formal qualities of a complaint with a Kadai in order to highlight the ways in which the picture is historically expressive. Luca Rubiquet's methods of Orientalist practice, her cross-cultural inquisitiveness, and attempts to understand select cultural attributes in Algeria, translate to the viewer a brief moment of communication between different peoples, that is, French cross-cultural learning about a long-standing Muslim legal practice. Of course, there's no refuting that a complaint with the Kadai can be read via many theoretical lenses. The painting was, after all, produced in a historical space which was deeply complex and multifaceted in time, space, gender, culture, race, and class. Today, this painting is an historically rich source, an expressive communicative tool offering insight into the meeting of two historicized forms of otherness, a French woman artist and an Algerian sociocultural attribute. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Mary, for your presentation. You. Uh, and now, please, if you have any questions. Hey, Dr. Doris. Who gave the picture this title? Because I know in some cases that sometimes the gallerist, or later on, not necessarily the painter themselves, he or she, gave this title. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I'm asking is because I'm wondering if this is a really a scene of a cardi and sitting on the same mat as a plaintiff, mm -hmm. or if it not couldn't be possibly, for example, the scene of a scribe and a customer, as they are street scrap, which, uh, or a teacher with a student, for example. Uh, well, because it would be surprising that a card would be seated like that with a plaintiff. Okay, that, that's a very interesting uh, question, an important question, thank you. The title was given to the painting by the artist. Um, I, definitely, I know this because she exhibited the painting at the Salon of Paris in 1896 and this is the title she submitted to the salon. So, but can I ask, can I probe a little further, why do you think that this is not a Kadai? I don't think that the Muslim Kadi at any time in even Algeria would be seated just like that, sharing the same mat with a plaintiff. Uh, he would be seated separately, and he, it very likely that we would have his, a notary or a secretary or an assistant <coughs> sitting on his side. This intimacy is, in my view, and according to my knowledge, in okay. contradiction to uh, 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 this practice. Okay. And would it vary from country to country? For example, um, a colleague <coughs> of mine Not um, extent. from, I mean, from I Algeria. I would be surprised. Yeah. It needs really checking, yeah. a very thorough check that it's this, this, and not a teacher. Because the Arabic script also suggests that it could be a teacher and a student. Okay. The second li lower line about knowledge. 
It is not necessary. It has nothing to do with jurisprudence. Okay. So it is it God. Uh, uh, God make me knowledgeable. Yeah. And this rather suggests teacher and student uh, and pupil, or perhaps as well. There are many Orientalists who have depicted uh, scribes on the street. Yes, scribe. Yes, I've seen many. But the and Kadi the black person is likely to be someone who is not educated and who goes to the scribe. And there are many uh, quite a genre of scribe and customer and scribe around the people. Well, that's thought provoking. Thank you very much. Quick. It's a very, very short comment to Doris's uh, re remark. Uh, the, the black person looks quite dignified, and mm -hmm. he, he is um, mm, dress code actually suggests that he's uh, coming from probably royal entourage. Maybe he's a eunuch, and he's complaining about the situation happening at the court or something. But I, I have a question, if I may. The, the calligraphy in, on the top corner suggests that it was uh, produced by European and I'm sorry, uh, suggest? suggests that it was uh, uh, executed by a European okay. person. Okay. And uh, I wonder if you know anything about um, Luca Rubique uh, learning Arabic or learning how. Right. Well, I wish I could answer that. And I have searched for about five years now for her ego documents, um, her notes, her diaries, and I have not yet found them. Um, what I do know is that Luca Rubiquet was an only child. She had no children. So I'm wondering, was there someone in her family to continue her legacy after she died? The reason I'm questioning this is because her uh, last will and testament is held by the tax office of Frijou in uh, the south of France. And they have told me I can view it in uh, uh, 2059. So it's, it's uh, on my to-do list for my 81st birthday. So, <laughs> so no, I would love to know more. And if anybody can share any insights on how to source ego documents, something that I haven't covered, uh, please do approach me and let me know. So I can't answer that yet. OK, but thank, thank you, you for your to question. Thank you for your for you. For exactly. But, but, uh, <laughs> the, uh, Thank you very much for this introduction for all of this very beautiful painter. And uh, I think it's such a contrast to what we have as a stereotype of French Orientalism, a, a woman depicting fully covered men compared with uh, some piles of female flesh. Yeah, Thank I agree. You. Thank you very much. Well, uh, a very excellent presentation. Thank you very much. Thank uh, you. And, uh, Please excuse my English. Uh, first of all, I would like to support uh, Professor Doris Beren Abu Saif's uh, views on these two gentlemen. And uh, I think that she's right. And I would like to add something that uh, the uh, jurist, the Qadi, most probably he's not Qadi, uh, but he must be a Mufti. Because I, I myself. I'm sorry, what, what is a Mufti? I don't mufti know. Mufti is, is, a, a, is a jurist. And uh, he, he always works with juridical documents. And uh, I myself uh, studied one, uh, more than 150 manuscripts of Central Asian origin. And uh, uh, Professor Doris Beren Abu Saif uh, is right in saying that Qadis, uh, I've seen many similarities, uh, are almost uh, 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 they do the same functions everywhere in the Islamic world. I mean, in those times, at least. So, uh, in uh, Professor Doris Berin Abu Saif's comments, I've seen many similarities uh, in the practices in Algeria, Morocco, and Central Asia. So, uh, I think uh, that gentleman must be uh, Mufti or teacher, but not Qadi. Okay, thank because, you very much. Yeah, because, because of, uh, because of uh, um, intimacy and uh, other many uh, minor features. This is, this is just a comment. No, it's and much appreciated. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. I did. I checked with um, a colleague of mine who works in this area, and he mentioned that it reminds him of uh, Kadai practice in Algeria. But this is something I do have to check into, so thank you for bringing that to my attention. It's very important. Uh, hello, thank you. Um, very much enjoyed your presentation, and I would certainly I? agree with the two previous um, questioners. Oh, and there are many representations of um, Arab scribes 
um, and particularly the one by John Frederick Lewis mm. that shows, um, shows him with a, 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 a white girl, but also a black one. Um, but I just wondered what, whether you have also looked at um, um, Miss uh, Luca Robique, is that the pronunciation? Yes, yes. Um, her own ethnicity. She seemed to me to be very dusky. This is the second time this has been asked to me. Um, <laughs> I'd love to see that portrait blown up a bit more so that yeah. we could... I mean, do you know much about her family background? Her family background, her father uh, was from Brittany. Her mother was from Normandy. Um, her father was uh, uh, French. He worked in the French military. Um, so, and this is where, this is far back as her, her record that I have gone. So, is she, are you, are you suggesting that she may be Arabic or... or that she may have some Arabic or um, some, uh, as you say, yes. Well, what I know at the moment is that her parents were, are French. Yes. Both of her parents further, are French. Back but I that. need to go further yeah. back, exactly. <laughs> so, but this is the second time it's yeah. been suggested it to just, me. It did remind me, having, having been sitting here last week, mm. listening to a lecture on um, Africans in Georgian Britain, um, which included Queen Charlotte. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, thank you for your comment. Thank you very much, Dr. Yeah. Mary. Thank you. Thank you very much.